I guess we're just under 200 participants. That's a good number. So again, welcome back. Uh, I'm your overall meeting moderator, Tom Mumley. And uh, just be before I introduce the next panel, I just want to remind you that I, that I, or maybe I emphasize that we want to focus our attention to make sure only non-polluting giant baseballs are discharged to the bay and none of those polluting Dodger baseballs. So I think if we put our minds to, uh, attention to that, we will, uh, the bay will be happier. Okay, so with uh, that little warm up, it's my pleasure to introduce the moderator for the next session on uh, urban stormwater, Chris Summers, we, who, uh, and I had a, have a long standing professional friendship. Chris is, is a well known local expert in, uh, uh, on what, is, what are effective stormwater management actions and stormwater monitoring and assessment. He's a long standing participant in the RMP, rep particularly representing the municipal stormwater sector on the technical review committee and uh, very active in the sources, pathways, and loadings work group. He, Chris is vice president of EOA Inc. And uh, with that, take it away, Chris. Okay. Okay. Great. Thanks, Tom. Um, so as Tom said, I'm Chris Summers, and I'm, I'm really super excited to, to be the moderator today of this session on stormwater. Um, this is a subject that's been the focus of my career um, and the careers of, I think, of many of you uh, in the audience and, of course, our exemplary scientists that were that are speaking in this session today. As you know, stormwater is a, a dynamic and evolving topic, um, which is really the reason why it's both incredibly challenging and exciting field of study. And just like wastewater, uh, which we heard about er, uh, prior to the break, stormwater quality is truly a, a mirror of our society. Um, it's a product, if it's a product, a chemical, a material that people use, and if it's exposed to rainfall or the environment, then you're likely to find it in stormwater. Uh, in this session, we're gonna uh, hear about groundbreaking and innovative work from our speakers um, that have led uh, uh, studies over the last few years. Lisa Sabin and uh, Lester McKee will talk about recent approaches that they've developed to better understand sources of complex pollutants like PCBs and stormwater, which even after decades, we're still learning more about. Prior to that presentation, we'll hear from Kelly Moran and Diana Lynn, who will speak about the knowledge they've been gaining on recent and emerging chemicals and materials that may pose threats to water quality. Uh, on a broader uh, side of things, the RMP has, has played a lead role in each of these studies, which have been collaboratively funded through a variety of organizations and agencies to better understand stormwater sources, pathways, and loadings. And as demonstrated through these studies, the RMP has yet again been on the forefront of helping advance water quality science and answering emerging questions that inform management of stormwater in the Bay Area. So with that, um, I'm happy to introduce our first presenter, Kelly Moran, Dr. Kelly Moran, who will be speaking about new contaminants of emerging concern associated with tires. Dr. Moran joined SFEI in late 2020 to investigate contaminants of emergent concern in microplastics, including tires. And she transitioned back to her scientific, um, from her scientific roots after uh, 25 years assisting government agencies with managing water pollution from consumer products like vehicle brake pads and pesticides. Kelly has served on many scientific advisory panels, um, including the California Green Science uh, Ribbon Science Panel, which she co-chairs. Uh, just as a side note, as presentations are underway, please ask questions in the Q&A, and depending on the time availability, we may take a question or two at the end of each presentation, but we will have a 20-minute Q&A session at the end of the session uh, to answer all questions. So I'll, I'll uh, it's up to you, Kelly. All right. I am extremely pleased and honored to have the opportunity to share uh, some stories with you um, about what we've learned about tires and water pollution and the lessons that these are teaching us about understanding both emerging contaminants and microplastics. So um, as many folks might remember, who, since this is a pretty engaged audience, 
back in uh, the winter time this year, there was news that hit the headlines in all kinds of major news outlets, even Fox News covered it, that a uh, chemical from tires was killing salmon. So let's unpack that a little bit. Uh, what happened, what was figured out after several decades of this going on was that um, some very clever chemistry and toxicology work together. So um, there's a chemical that's a preservative in tires um, called 6-PPD, and it's one of several p-phenylenediamine preservatives that are used um, in tires. Um, it composes between um, 0.4 and 2% of the total weight of tire tread by, um, so quite a bit of it. What happens is that um, it reacts with ozone in the air and forms a transformation product called 6-PPD quinone. That chemical is very toxic to coho salmon. So here's a picture of a coho migrating back um, to its home stream to lay its eggs. And what's been happening, and it's been very highly observed in the Washington uh, State Puget Sound area, is the coho were going back to spawn and they would die before they spawn. And they go up during a storm event. So the stormwater runoff was literally killing them within hours due to the presence of this chemical. So this chemical is also present in Bay Area runoff and so exceeded the LC50, that's the mortality threshold for coho in four of nine sampled Bay Area creeks and storm drains. Uh, there are no coho present in the Bay watershed anymore. Um, it is possible because this chemical has been in tires for a long time that said the 6-PPD and its transformation product actually contributed to the loss of coho in our, in our cream streaks or creeks. 6-PPD um, quinone is not immediately lethal to other salmon, uh, but there is suggestive evidence of sublethal effects in other salmonids, notably steelhead, which we do have runs of in the Bay watershed. Uh, so there is now work underway examining the linkage between the runoff, the um, tire leachate, and this particular chemical and steelhead to see if that is actually true. So that's something that stay look forward for upcoming events in that. Um, so this is really unusual because normally the pollution that we deal with is sublethal. So there's long-term effects on populations and ecosystems. This was acute mortality. So I, I just want to emphasize how unusual and strong of an effect this is as compared to what we normally deal with and what we're normally finding of high concern for the Bay and its watersheds. Another thing that's really notable about what happened here is how quickly it happened. So the chemical was dissolved into water during storm events and quickly moved into the fish, the fish are exposed and the lethal effect occurs. So it's all very fast. And there we go, all right. So this is an example of a lesson from tires. So today what I'm gonna do is give an overview of the um, story of tire related water pollution. That's gonna be at a really high level um, and hit a few key points. So one is this concept of transformation products. So that's, that's the example of 6-PPD and the transformation to the quinone. Another one um, is just a reminder that CECs are in stormwater. We've kind of touched on this before, but um, it, in some cases there can be enough to, enough to cause harm. I, there's been a lot of folks who think that emerging contaminants are only coming out of wastewater treatment plants and the, the data um, that are getting um, generated here in the Bay Area and elsewhere in the world are telling us, no, we need to look at urban runoff as well. So part of the reason that people think that everything's only in wastewater treatment plants is that so much work on both emerging contaminants and microplastics has been done almost exclusively in Europe. Um, and there they have primarily combined sewer systems. So they're, all their runoff is flowing through a sewage treatment plant. And it turns out we're not Europe. I think we all know that but it makes a really big difference in what's happening in the environment because all that tire debris isn't getting removed by sewage treatment plants. It has the opportunity and the chemicals have the opportunity to be released directly um, into runoff and flow directly into creeks. Um, the we're not Europe theme also plays out for other microplastics and Diana will be talking a little bit about that. Um, another lesson is that CECs are looking in plastics. 
So it's something that we have to think about when we're trying to figure out and understand what's going on with CECs and getting into the Bay and their potential effects. So there's a real intersection between the regional monitoring programs, microplastics, emerging contaminants, and stormwater work. So now I'll just say, again, the, the bigger picture of the story. The tire particles and chemicals wash into storm drains um, after, so basically the, the tires used, it wears, they wash into storm drains. Uh, the storm drains, as I think everyone here knows, flows directly into surface water with little or no treatment. There are some places where there are treatment, but for the most part, runoff is, flows untreated into creeks and to San Francisco Bay. Um, particles and leachate from tires are both toxic to aquatic organisms, and there is the potential to harm fish and ecosystems. So more beyond just the lethal effects to coho, there's a lot of other potential effects, and that's what's coming out in the literature. So stepping back a little bit more, um, tire tread wearing off during use. So I've got a photo of a new tire next to the used tire just to remind you how much wears off. Um, there are various uh, release estimates. So um, our recent review um, compiled all of those and the US tire release wear estimate is between three and five and a half kilograms per year per person. So um, we don't have an estimate right now for the San Francisco Bay Area. That's something that we're working on to see if we can get a better sense of that mass. Uh, we do have an estimate of the total number of particles, which we can't convert quickly into mass. And it's on the order of about 3 trillion tire particles entering the Bay every year. So that's um, somewhere in the order of 50 million pounds of tire wear material getting emitted into the Bay watershed every year, uh, most of which probably doesn't wash off, but it could easily be 500,000 or a million pounds of tire material that can wash off. In addition, uh, chemicals can be released on the watershed so the tire particle doesn't have to make it to the Bay. So um, just to make sure that everyone has a real picture of how big three to five and a half kilograms is, that's about the size of a baby or a cat. That's quite a lot of material being released for each of us each year, not just from our own driving, but also from trucks and delivery vehicles and all the other services that we receive. It's, so it's not just our own driving that causes that release. So a second theme about um, emerging contaminants and plastics is unfortunately that plastics like tires contain a lot more than just the polymer. So tires are about half rubber and about half other ingredients. Of the other ingredients, there are three kinds that have the um, greatest potential to contain chemicals that could be harmful to aquatic ecosystems. So one is process and extender oils. Um, in the past, those were known to contain dioxins. Um, they still may contain polyaromatic hydrocarbons or PAHs. Uh, the amount of that is uncertain. Uh, U.S. manufacturers tell us that they've changed um, their suppliers so that that would be insignificant, but we don't have information about the half of tires that are sold in California that come from overseas. Additives include preservatives like that 6-PPD and other plasticizers. Um, another one a category is what they call vulcanization agents. The one that's gotten a lot of um, buzz in the water quality community is zinc because zinc from tires has been identified as a potentially significant source of zinc and urban runoff. So the RMP has been working on tire particles and chemicals and has done several relevant studies. So the first is that we did a study um, that used a technique called non-targeted analysis to look at some bay water samples. And non-targeted analysis is a screening kind of chemical analysis method that helps us um, basically go on a detective hunt and say, what chemicals are there? It's not very quantitative. So it's some place where we can get a feel for what chemicals are present and perhaps their order of magnitude or relative abundance, but it's not quantitative. So we can't say, we know X concentration of X chemical as a result of this method, but it's an awesome screening method to allow us to really get a sense of the chemical families that are present. 
So that work identified that um, in an area that was um, subject to stormwater flow, San Leandro Bay, that uh, tire chemicals, chemicals associated with tires uh, were abundant. They were also present elsewhere, but they were really abundant in San Leandro Bay. So that work caused the RMP to follow up with two sets of studies. There's been a multi-year urban runoff study looking at roadway pollutants, including tire chemicals that's still in progress, but nearing completion. Uh, that's the, the preview is definitely there's tire chemicals in urban runoff. Um, and the first samples were just taken on an in-bay study looking for these roadway pollutants, including the tire chemicals. So stay tuned for the results of that in coming years. And then um, the RMP was also um, a partial funder of a large study that we did on microplastics a couple of years ago. And the key findings of that, just as a refresher, are that um, tire particles are the most common microplastic flowing into San Francisco Bay. So they were common in stormwater and sediment. Um, and although they were not detected in bay water and other media, um, one of the reasons for that is because the sampling methodology wasn't able to grasp those tiny dense particles. So we don't expect them to linger for long in the, in the bay water, but the chemicals from them could. So the study design wasn't perfect, but it gave us really important information that those tire particles exist and they're moving around and getting to San Francisco Bay. So, so stepping back for a moment, in the world of microplastics and emerging contaminants, most people are thinking of them separately. So there's people who are working on tire particles and there's other people who are working on tire chemicals and it seems like the two never meet, but they are one. You cannot test a tire particle, say for toxicity without testing at the same time, the toxicity of the chemicals within the particle, they are part of the system. And the chemicals, everything, every place they go in the environment, those particles are taking the chemicals with them and releasing them. So this is a really important way of approaching the, the work in chemicals and microplastics. And it is pretty unique to the RMP. I've actually been really surprised how many meetings I go to where I'm talking to one audience about the other thing and so on. So tire particles are ubiquitous. So they've been reported in air, stormwater, all kinds of aquatic environments and organisms. Tire related chemicals have been found in urban runoff in creeks. Um, and we've of course found them that we know they're present in, in the Bay, uh, but we need to know more about that. Um, it's very likely that they'll, they're being released in aquatic sediment and into organisms even though that chemical release has not yet been proven, it seems very likely. So what's happening is that the particles at the point of release, they start releasing the chemicals into the environment. So that's how they get into stormwater runoff so quickly. The surface area is great and the release occurs very quickly. So that same kind of process likely also occurs with other microplastics. Like tires, most plastics have large fractions of additives in them. Um, it's not uncommon for other plastic chem plastics to contain up to 40% um, additives. So that includes fibers, which are been, been very important in terms of potential toxicity. So we have to think about microplastics as a conveyor of um, chemicals. So what does this mean for the RMP's work? So Miguel earlier showed um, the chart and the, the, our tiered risk framework and um, that highlighted the chemicals of moderate concern, the emerging contaminants of moderate concern, which I'm showing here. And um, of these, all of them except for fipronil are almost certainly appear in plastics. So they're plastic additives. A little question mark about imidacloprid. But that means that as we're exploring our further and really trying to understand our moderate concern chemicals, we'll need to consider um, plastics as a potential conveyance for them into the environment. Now, we don't know if they're big or small. That's a, a question that needs to be answered, um, whether the, the plastics are the most important source or conveyance or whether they're, whether they're not. But it's something that we have to consider as we design our monitoring programs. 
So they're hiding in there. And, and that's the thing, the theme, just to remember that every time you're looking at a microplastic, you're also looking at whatever chemicals are within it. So lessons for us is that we uh, need to um, make sure that we're considering the microplastics as the source and conveyance of our emerging contaminants as we design our projects. And it reaffirms something we've already started working on, which is the intersection of our microplastics, emerging contaminants, and stormwater work. So now here's a little preview of coming attractions uh, to start with. Uh, we are working on a tire strategy for the regional monitoring program that we're planning to have a draft on up in the spring. And that's gonna focus on the Bay and tire related chemicals in particular. We've got a whole bunch going to give us free information to put into that strategy that I'm really excited about. Uh, one of those is that I'm privileged to be the co-chair of an international tire science session at the Society of Environmental and Toxicology and Chemistry Conference in November. Um, it covers a broad array of scientific disciplines around tires, and that's basically work that we can learn from and bring the lessons of all that science that's going on elsewhere in the country and the world into our work. Uh, we will be wrapping up the RMP specific stormwater conceptual model report that builds on the Ocean Protection Council um, report that the report that was mostly funded by them that Diana will be talking about next. And we will continue to provide data to DTSC Safer Consumer Products Program, which is taking a look at tires. And uh, Dr. Ann Cooper Doherty will be talking more about how they use our, our data. We're one of the only, in fact, the only California emerging contaminants program that's really monitoring program that's looking at new chemicals like these. So I I'm just excited that we can provide those kind of data to, to DTSC and looking forward to having Dr. Doherty tell us about how we use it. And uh, finally, we um, were privileged to um, receive some free consulting services from a UC Berkeley group called Beacon. Uh, we've asked them to do a tire industry assessment to inform our work on tires, including the RMP tire strategy. And here's the project team that's doing this work for us. Um, they'll be helping us figure out some things like the relevance of available tire data, which is mostly from Europe. Um, we're guessing that that's a diff different market than the market for tires in the US. And so therefore a lot of the data that are out there may not be as um, necessarily representative of tires in our market. I'm hoping that they'll be able to give us some information to help us improve our Bay Area tire emissions estimates and to supply information that we can share with others who are developing, um, doing testing with tire particles so that they can develop representative tire samples. A lot of people are just using one tire and since tire formulations vary a huge amount, uh, the, sci the science is uh, difficult to interpret when they, when they do that. And I'm hoping that this will also help us prioritize our future scientific studies. And finally, they, um, it's a multidisciplinary team. So although they're affiliated with the business school, they've got a bunch of um, environmental science background, um, a really great team. So they're, um, and we are talking about an add-on that would um, do some mapping work to help us look at the intersections of roadway emission points and watersheds that have sensitive sandmine populations. So um, I just for those, since there's so many folks on the webcast, um, I did want to point out that this is a group of folks who are gaining real life practical experience in the environmental field. So they're the kind of people that you might want to recruit. They have a commitment to diversity and I've heard from a lot of agencies, they'd like to hire applicants that look more like California. And so if you have a job opening, um, please send it to the Gmail address here on the slide. And uh, that'll give you an, a new crew of potential applicants that I think could be quite talented for you based on the work I've done with the UC Berkeley team so far. So that wraps it up. I'd like to finish by thanking our funders, the Regional Monitoring Program, which is all of you, and the Ocean Protection Council for this work. Great, thanks, Kelly. So we, we, we do have a number of questions. Um, and maybe I'll just take one now. I think we have time for one or two. Um, the question came up about uh, tire wear, but also the use of recycled tires um, in roadway surfaces and, and probably other applications too, I would assume. Um, 
uh, as uh, uh, ball fields and it you know, being used other places as well. Um, you want to speak to what do we know about the sources and how important those are as well? Absolutely. So this is a question that comes up repeatedly. So we were able to look into that in the work that uh, Diana is going to talk about for the Ocean Protection Council. And uh, there's actual data on um, the quantity of material used and how it's used that's available from the, the um, Cal Recycle. So we were able to take a look at that and the exposure potential. So the quantity used is pretty small compared to the emissions estimates for tires for tire tread. And the particle sizes are much larger than tire wear debris. Uh, so there's a lot less surface area for all the chemistry and environmental fate and chemical release to occur. Um, and a lot of the uses don't involve exposures to the environment. So even for example, in pavement, you think rubberized pavement is a lot of pavement, but it's actually only, I think it's less than 1% by mass rubber. And most of that is locked into the pavement. So some of it does come out and get released. So it's not zero, but relative to the amount of tire wear on a road, it's very small. So there are more details on this that are in the coming attraction report that Diana will be talking about. But I, that is something we've thought about pretty thoroughly. Good. Well, that's a good segue. So I think we're out of time for, thank you very much. Um, uh, let's let's uh, trans transition over to Dr. Diana Lin. Um, she's a senior scientist with SFEI and leads the RMP Microplastic Work Group. Diana joined SFEI um, four years ago um, during their first year of sampling in San Francisco Bay mic Microplastic Study, and she investigates other contaminants of emergent concern and legacy contaminants as well. And before she joined SFEI, Diana worked for the California State Legislature as a policy fellow. So welcome, Diana. Great. Well, thank you so much. I'm really excited to share to start for where Kelly left off and share our most recent work on microplastics. And this is work that our whole microplastic team has been working on. And so I wanted to acknowledge my co-authors. In 2019, we, together with the Five Gyres Institute and the University of Toronto, completed a three-year study of microplastics in the San Francisco Bay. This was a $1 million project that is still cited as the most comprehensive regional study of microplastics published in the world to date. And the findings from the study forms the foundation of our understanding of microplastics in the Bay. We investigated two major pathways for microplastics to enter the bay. This was an urban stormwater runoff, which as Kelly mentioned, is largely untreated and treated wastewater effluent. What we found was that average concentrations in stormwater was two orders of magnitude greater than average concentrations we measured in wastewater. And no one else had published this kind of comparative analysis previously. This has really shifted our focus on trying to understand the sources of microplastics away from laundry water and the wastewater pathway and, and with more focus on stormwater. Therefore, our most current work on microplastics has been to conduct a literature review to better understand what the most recent, uh, most uh, current science is on understanding the major sources of microplastics and how they enter urban stormwater. So we've been doing this by developing stormwater conceptual models and creating a separate conceptual model for each of the major sources. This includes tires and fibers, which together compose over 80% of the particles identified in stormwater. We also developed a separate conceptual model for cigarette filters because these are often usually made of cellulose acetate and we saw a lot of cellulose acetate fibers in our base stormwater samples. We also developed a conceptual model for single use plastic foodware uh, because along with cigarette filters, these are the most abundant litter items and we wanted to inform pollution prevention policies. Uh, this literature review was largely funded by the Ocean Protection Council as well as the RMP and was a full team effort with each of us leading different parts of the report. And we'll be submitting this report uh, to the OPC um, in the next week. We're just wrapping up some finishing design elements. 
So this is an example of the stormwater conceptual models that we've developed. And this is a fibers one that was led by Kelly Moran. So I've been told that this is really complicated and you are all gonna stop listening to me as, I, as soon as I show this. So I'm going to try to focus your attention. Uh, in these conceptual models, we tried to systematically document the, um, all the potential sources of fibers. This includes indoor fibers that can be tracked or emitted outdoors, as well as outdoor products that can shed fibers. And we have almost no information on the fiber release rates of these products. And so um, it's almost impossible to prioritize what are the dominant sources. The next box I wanna bring your attention to is this air box that has a lot of arrows passing through it. Uh, we think that air transport is an important pathway for microplastics, particularly for fibers, because fibers have large surface areas and tend to be very light, which allows them to be suspended in air and transported long distances. And the challenging thing is there is very few air monitoring data, and therefore it's very hard um, to uh, figure out what the major sources to the air are. Fibers are the most ubiquitous form of microplastics detected in the environment, um, most abundant that are ingested by wildlife and have been measured in remote locations far away from human activity. Our major hypothesis that we present in our report is that dryers and dryer vents are important sources of fibers. And surprisingly, there's been very few studies looking at uh, fiber emissions from dryers. And the few studies that have, been have, that have been published suggest that there are more fibers that are shed from drying our clothing than washing. And one reason why we think this is an understudied source is that dryer, these type of dryers are actually really rare in the rest of the world. Um, most of the rest of the world uses unvented condenser dryers or hang dry their clothing. This means that microplastic studies conducted in other parts of the world may not be representative of US and California conditions. Air transport can also be important for other sources of microplastics. This is a diagram that was published from a really cool study that was just published this year by an international group of atmospheric scientists. Um, in this study, they uh, developed a model to model atmospheric transport of microplastics around the world. And they also pointed out the lack of air monitoring data to better understand the major sources. In this model, they estimated that a significant amount of microplastics are entrained in the atmosphere. This means that there's so much microplastics that already been mismanaged and broken down into the microplastics that these microplastics just continue to cycle around the world through the Earth's geochemical cycles. Um, this model suggested that continents are actually net importers of microplastics from the ocean. And that a significant amount of, of the microplastics that we observe today is actually from legacy plastic sources from around the world um, that's broken down into microplastics and continue to get moved around the world. So this presents a really um, important question for us in California is whether uh, global and legacy pollution is an important source of microplastics via long-range transport. And this idea that long-range transport could be an important source of microplastics really challenges our conceptual understanding of microplastics in the Bay. Um, we haven't substantially included um, air transport as a major pathway, even though we acknowledge that it is a pathway, but we haven't investigated it. And in our previous modeling of the Bay, we've uh, model transport of microplastics from the bay to the ocean, but haven't really thought about transport of microplastics from the ocean back to the bay. And so more air monitoring data is really important for understanding the relative importance of uh, short range versus long range transport and local versus global sources of plastics. So once these microplastics are in the air, they can be deposited onto our urban landscape via wet and dry deposition. And I've highlighted the arrows downstream from the air pathway in red. So once deposited on land, then runoff, especially from stormwater runoff, can pick up microplastics as well as other contaminants and transport them downstream towards storm drains, urban waterways, and the ocean. In these uh, conceptual models, we're mostly focusing on the transport of the particles um, through, through the landscape and from sources. 
But as Kelly has talked about, we really need to think about the chemicals that are also in the microplastics. And we learned this lesson with the tire wear particles with the lesson from 6 PPV quinone. But other microplastics, I mean, other sources like textiles are all, also include a lot of chemical ingredients. For example, uh, Miguel talked about PFAS that makes our clothing stain-proof or waterproof. Um, textiles and other single-use plastics can also be made with um, organophosphate esters, bisphenols. In a webinar that I just heard about, learned from last week, um, it was an industry study led by IKEA and H&M they found ethoxylated surfactants to be ubiquitous in um, secondary um, in secondhand textiles. And as Kelly mentioned, all of these uh, chemical classes that I've mentioned are moderate concerns for the bay and are prioritized because concentrations of the bay suggest that there could be harm for wildlife. And we don't know the role microplastics have in uh, transporting these chemicals. And we also know that Cigarette filter leachate is extremely toxic and contains heavy metals, nicotine, and a mixture of combustion products. Uh, a little bit about cigarette filters and single-use plastic foodware. The conceptual model for these um, focused because are slightly different in that these are typically released into the environment as litter, but they can break down into microplastics um, while they're in the urban landscape. Cigarette filters tend to break down more easily, but the cellulose acetate used in cigarette filters uh, doesn't break down readily. And so while it can break down into fibers, the fibers themselves are persistent. And for all microplastics, um, the environmental conditions, the type of plastic are all important factors in how quickly the microplastic break down into smaller microplastics. And so for addressing micro, um, microplastic pollution, particularly for cigarette filters and single-use plastic. We need to focus on uh, source control as well as um, preventing litter and waste. And trying to inform pollution prevention has been our um, goal from the start in developing these conceptual models. And so we also developed a diagram to highlight the wide range of intervention points for mitigating release of microplastics as well as their chemicals. We've identified span the range from prevention to remediation. We also identified the various actors that would implement these action, actions, including representatives from industry, government, and community actors. So this is the mitigation uh, strategy diagram uh, for cigarette filters that was led by Ezra Miller. And again, I'm not gonna go to this in detail, but I wanted to highlight a few of the mitigation strategies uh, we identified for each of the primary sources we focused on. Uh, so in terms of products can be redesigned to remove toxic ingredients um, from their products. So one example is DTSC's Safer Consumer Program re Regulations that is currently looking at tire ingredients. Or products can be redesigned um, so that we reduce plastic waste, which is not using single-use plastic foodware for certain types of products. If we find that drier emissions are actually an important source of fibers, then we can change, uh, we can support uh, behavior changes to change the way we um, dry our clothing. Uh, we can reduce overall washing frequency, which is also recommended by these gap um, denim care instructions to wash less, Say, skip the dryer and to save energy. We can use condenser dryers more like the rest of the world, a hang dry clothing, and government and industry have a role in supporting these behavior changes. For tire emissions, which Kelly mentioned earlier is the dominant source of microplastics, um, there's actually a really innovative approach to capturing tire wear particles. Uh, we know of at least two startup companies that have develop technologies to capture tire wear particles at the source by retrofitting vehicles with these devices that can capture the tire wear. And the most downstream strategy uh, we listed in this diagram, which is Apple for, for all types of microplastics, is treating uh, stormwater through, treating uh, stormwater runoff. Um, we've done one study looking at the efficacy of bioretention rate gardens, um, but we also acknowledge that this isn't feasible to treat a significant portion of the stormwater runoff in the bay. So by developing these mitigation diagrams, uh, we hope to expand the discussion about uh, 
approaches to mitigating microplastics beyond remediation um, to thinking of more innovative solutions. As Kelly mentioned, uh, we are submitting our final report to the Ocean Protection Council. Um, and I, we're wrapping that up, just finishing up the design elements and it will be available on our website at the end of October. As we submit this uh, report to the OPC, um, our goal is to inform their statewide microplastic strategy. Um, and we had some highlights that I've um, mentioned in this presentation. This uh, so we point out that air transport is a major data gap, data gap to understand the important sources of microplastics. More modern data can inform the relative importance of short range and long range transport, as well as local versus global sources of microplastics. Second, chemical ingredients are really important. Um, and even though we generally have been monitoring and investigating the particles and the chemicals separately, we really need to continue to monitor them both and investigate them both because um, be, there are impacts from both. And through this exercise, a better understanding the major sources and pathways of microplastics, um, it really helped us identify the priority data gaps to inform management, as well as uh, various innovative approaches to mitigating microplastics. The RMP has already played a really important role in contributing to the science and policy discussions around microplastics. And so we look forward to continuing these conversations across the state. So thanks again to our funders, the OPC, OPC as well as the Regional Monitoring Program. And I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. Great, thanks, Diana. Um, really, groundbreaking and interesting stuff. And these conceptual models are super important. I can see, say from a stormwater management perspective of trying to understand sources and pathways and, and, and transport processes. Um, something you didn't cover, and I know it wasn't part of your study, but um, I know it comes up a lot and you hear it a lot is, you know, what do we know about ecological health impacts um, associated with these different pollutants and kind of where is that um, science and, and and um, research right now. And I know there's a lot been happening in the state uh, on this front. Um, maybe you could speak to that just to give people a perspective of what's been happening on that front. Yeah, um, there has been studies, but there, there is more to be done. Um, the RMP funded uh, a project for us to participate in a workshop with, that was led by the State Water Board, Southern Coastal Water Research Project, um, as well as other research institutes that um, that I might be missing um, to synthesize the available data and to uh, come up with ecological thresholds. Um, and they've successfully done that. And my understanding is they're um, putting that data together and going to publish that in a peer reviewed uh, later this year. Great, um, thank you for that. And then there's a question, are e-cigarettes a harm reduction strategy for <laughs> microplastic litter reduction? Um, my understanding is that e-cigarettes also have their plastic litter waste issue. Yeah, I think they go beyond just plastic litter waste uh, as well. They have other harmful chemicals associated with them as well. Um, that's great. Um, okay, I think we'll um, uh, we'll come back and and answer some of the other questions at the at the Q and A, um, and we'll we'll move on to our our next presenter at this point. Um, great. Thank you, Diana. So we're going to switch topics a little bit and um, away from emerging contaminants and um, microplastics and talk about advanced uh, uh, data analyses of stormwater monitoring data and approaches that we're using to identify sources. Um, there's a, this is a two-part uh, uh, presentation. Um, first, Dr. Lester McKee. Uh, senior scientist with the Clean Water Program at SFEI is going to speak. Um, he has designed and implemented research monitoring projects and watershed loading and LID focused areas for the last 20 plus years. Um, and Lester is a co-author of uh, author or co-author of 140 technical reports, 28 scientific journals. Lester is joining us from New Zealand today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, introduce Lisa real quick too, Lester. Um, Lisa Sabin is a senior scientist uh, at EOA in Oakland. 
and uh, she helps San Francisco Bay municipal agencies with stormwater management and pollutant control programs, mostly focused on ident identifying and addressing watershed sources of PCBs and mercury, two of our legacy issues in the Bay Area. Um, and Lisa has a bachelor's degree in chemistry from San Jose State and a master's and doctorate degrees from uh, UCLA. And Lisa joins us from San Jose, California. So Lester, I'll hand it over to you. Okay, thanks, Chris, for that kind of introduction. Can everybody hear me okay? And see the screen? Yes, Lester. Okay, so um, Lisa and I are going to uh, give relatively final update on our advanced analysis of stormwater da monitoring data, uh, a project that's been done over the last four years with RMP funding. So I think you're all aware San Francisco Bay is polluted with PCBs. Um, there are health advisories that recommend limited consumption of fish in San Francisco Bay because of that pollution. The peak, period, peak use period for PCBs was actually in 1975, some 45 years ago. So these bioaccumulative chemicals are really persistent. In response to these management uh, concerns, stormwater agencies are identifying the most polluted catchments, looking for sources, determining the best management response for those sources, and then treating those sources to reduce stormwater impacts to San Francisco Bay. As you can imagine, this takes a lot of time and a lot of money. So to support this effort, the RMP has been working with the stormwater management agencies over the last five or six years to characterize many sites around the Bay Area for PCB concentrations in water and on suspended sediment during one storm in many, many watersheds. However, catchment prioritization using this data has remained hampered by variations in flow and sediment erosion associated with different storm sizes, as well as the different land use distributions in these watersheds. And even once a catchment has been identified as, as a being of management interest, there are difficulties uh, in identifying the source properties further upstream. So to address these issues, the RMP supported funding two new data analysis methodologies, one based on loads and yields, and my co-authors Alicia Gilbreth, Jennifer Hunt, Jing Wu, Don Yi, and Jay Davis worked on this project uh, with me. And the other focusing on the use of congener data for profiling error clause in our watersheds. And this was largely led by Jay Davis and Alicia Gilbreth. These reports were published in, in 2019 and are available on our website. So giving a little bit more detail now on the loads and yields methodology, catchment mass loads of PCBs and yields from older industrial areas in each of the catchments were computed by combining rainfall with a modeled estimate of runoff and the concentrations of PCBs that we measured during storm. We then adjusted the loads to a standard storm size and divided that resulting load by the area of old industrial land use in each catchment. And the, and the key issue here is that the yield computed in this way allows us to directly compare source areas within our watersheds to one another rather than whole catchments. And that's the key advancement in this methodology. So to, to exemplify this and give you a an example of how this works. If we look at um, concentrations in relation to PCBs uh, between the Central Valley and our small uh, Bay Area small tributaries, you can see that the concentrations uh, in relation to stormwater are about 30 times greater in the small tributaries relative to the Central Valley. If we look at that data now in relation to concentrations for spinner sediment, you see that the concentrations for small tributaries are on average about double. But now if we think about the information in relation to yield, even though the concentrations in stormwater and on sediment are much lower in the Central Valley, using population in 1980 as a proxy for industrial and commercial use of PCBs, we don't have data on the land use of industrial and commercial areas for PCBs in, the, in California, so I just use population as a proxy, we can see that the Central Valley actually produces about the same loads per person to the bay as do the small tributaries around the bay. And so this shows you the power and the different information that's generated from each of these three main metrics that we're using to rank our data. I'll now give a little bit more detail on the Aeroclaw method that Jay and Alicia developed. If you remember, Aeroclaws are commercial mixtures of PCB congeners that were marketed and sold to the American public by Monsanto Corporation. 
The four main error clause are 1242, 1248, 1254, and 1260. Each mixture has a slightly different set of properties, making it ideal for certain uh, uses. For example, error core 1242 was used in the production of capacitors. Uh, error core 1254 and 1260 were used in the production of transformers, two of the largest uses of PCBs. Cork was uh, mainly um, produced using error core 1254. And as an example, hydraulic fluids um, were, were uh, uh, produced using all four error clause. So in order to advance the understanding of our sources in our watersheds, we selected congeners to fingerprint our samples to determine each of the error clause, clause present in the watershed sampling site. So for example, the fingerprint congeners for error clause 1242 were 18, 28, 31, and 33. Now I'll give you a little bit of a uh, window into the database that we've developed using these three methodologies. In the left-hand panel, you see concentrations on suspended sediment in nanograms per gram. The first thing I want you to note is there's a massive variation between our catchment areas in relation to this metric. The other thing I wanted you to notice is that based on this metric, there are a number of watersheds that rank very, very low and have very, very low concentrations. Uh, based on this metric alone, you probably wouldn't prioritize these watersheds for further management action. The other thing I want you to see from this database of 137 watersheds around the bay is that based on all three metrics, concentration on suspended sediment, concentration of stormwater, and yield from an old industrial areas, you see that uh, essentially for the highest ranking watersheds, all three metrics tend to agree. The next thing I'll point out is that some watersheds that have relatively moderate or low concentrations on suspended sediment have relatively high concentrations in stormwater. And then the last point I'd like to make with this slide is that on a basis of yields from old industrial areas, uh, watersheds that have relatively low or moderate concentrations for either or both suspended sediment or concentration of stormwater can have very, very high yields. And I wanna bring this point out a little bit more with a, a single case uh, study. In this case, from Rodeo Creek, I don't choose this watershed for any specific purpose other than to show the variation in the information derived from the different ranking methods. In this case, it's a, uh, a, a, a largely rural watershed with a small patch of old industrial area near the sampling point uh, near the outlet of the watershed. It's just 4% old industrial. And here we observed a concentration in stormwater of 14 nanograms per litre. This ranked 37th out of 137 catchments that are currently in their database. In relation to concentrations on suspended sediment, we found just five nanograms per gram, ranking 135th out of 137. In other words, in other words basically near the bottom of the data set. So on these two metrics, you would probably not prioritize uh, the industrial patch in this watershed as being high, um, of high management interest. However, if we now look at the rankings based on yield from that old industrial area, you see that out of 137 watersheds, this site actually ranks second. So that might indicate that there are some sources here that might be uh, treated, treatable. The primary error clause for this site are 1260 and 1242. So as we're looking upstream in this older industrial area, we might uh, consider these error clauses indicating certain types of potential land uses or source areas that we, that we might consider. So now uh, um, uh, uh, let Lisa take over um, and discuss how this data is being used by the stormwater agencies. So it's not letting me share my screen. Go ahead. Oh, there we go. All right. Um, can you see my screen okay? Okay, great. So thank you, Lester. And good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so the main reason that I'm here today is to demonstrate how the stormwater programs can use the results from these advanced analysis methods primarily to support our efforts to identify and address watershed sources of PCBs. So the stormwater program, programs have been using the RMP monitoring data for a number of years now, 
um, primarily to help us prioritize catchments for source investigations or other controls to reduce PCBs. So here's a quick overview of the current methods that we're using for prioritizing our areas for source investigation. First, we use screening level stormwater samples collected at catchment outlets, and then we apply thresholds to identify catchments where we think source investigations are needed. And we've identified preliminary thresholds based on the regional data set of stormwater samples that have been collected by the RMP and the stormwater programs across the Bay Area over about 20 years now. The regional data distributions that are shown here with the PCB concentrations on suspended sediment on the left and the PCB concentrations in water on the right. We've set our investigation threshold at the top 15th percentile of either one of these distributions. And we target catchments above these thresholds for source investigations or other management actions. Uh, but it's really important to note that these thresholds are not definitive um, and they definitely leave the possibility of missed opportunities. So I've identified here two of the stormwater program's ongoing data needs related to our PCB source investigation efforts. Um, first, we need to identify high priority catchments that are contributing elevated PCBs to stormwater so we know where we should focus our management actions. And then second, we want to identify those low priority catchments that are not contributing elevated stormwater loads so we don't need additional management actions. And the advanced analysis results um, we think can support these data needs in a number of ways, which I've listed here. Uh, first, we have the normalized yields that provide us with another metric we can use to prioritize our catchments for management actions. Um, second, the normalized yields provide a direct comparison of source area loads across different catchments. This one is key. Third, we can reduce our risk of false negatives. Uh, the Rodeo Creek example that Lester just um, talked about is a good example of that, where we wouldn't have focused on that catchment otherwise. Fourth, the new methods provide us with a standardized approach to identify sites that may require resampling. And then finally, the Aerochlor indicators can provide hints at the type of sources we might wanna look for in a catchment since certain air cores are associated with specific uses. So all of this information can be used to help support our source identification efforts. So I'd now like to show you specific examples of the data outputs that demonstrate the additional information provided by these advanced analysis methods. So this figure shows a comparison of the outcomes of our current thresholds based on PCB concentrations on suspended sediment compared with the normalized yields. The blue circles represent a single sampled storm event. The y-axis is the PCB concentration on suspended sediment and the x-axis shows the sample results in the order from highest on the left to lowest concentration on the right. And then the orange triangles highlight the sites that have high yields based on these new methods. So for the most part, the samples that are above our current thresholds also have high yields, um, indicating these are catchments that should be prioritized for source investigations. Uh, and we've been doing investigations in these catchments. Um, however, you'll notice there are a number of sites that have moderate or even very low PCB concentrations, um, but they have high yields. So these sites should also be investigated for sources, and they would have been missed based on the concentration data thresholds alone. So this figure really demonstrates the value of the new method uh, to help us identify high priority catchments that we might otherwise miss. So in this next example, uh, the figure shows the same data we just looked at, um, but now the brown triangles are highlighting the sites that, based on the new data analysis methods, um, suggest they may require resampling, primarily because these were small storms um, and possibly just too small to be 
um, characteristic of the loads in those catchments. So if we want to prioritize these catchments, we'll really need to collect more sample data. And this figure here, um, again, it's showing the same data, but now it's highlighting in yellow triangles those sites that had prominent Aeroclore indicators. Um, and so if any of these sites also had high yields, um, then when we go in and do our investigation, we may want to look for uh, very specific sources that are suggested by the dominant Aeroclores uh, during that investigation. And then this is my last example, and I want to show this um, to demonstrate a little bit more clearly how we might be able to use the Aeroclore indicator results. Um, so this figure shows a map of a small catchment. Um, this is a catchment where we already have conducted an in-depth source investigation, um, and that investigation started um, initially with a stormwater sample that was collected at the catchment outfall. Um, that sample had high PCB concentrations. So based on that sample, we went into the catchment, we investigated various properties, um, and we collected additional sediment samples that were adjacent to or on properties that we suspected as being potential sources. Um, and you can see, if you can see my um, cursor, the, these green areas here that we sampled all throughout this area, um, they were all low for PCBs, um, but one property on in this catchment had moderate and high PCBs on the property itself here. Um, and we didn't have the uh, advanced analysis data results at the point where we conducted this investigation. But now that we have these results, uh, they show us that the dominant Aeroclore that was in the original stormwater sample was 1254. And caulk was a major use of 1254. Um, and we also know that this property is a former caulk manufacturing site. So if we had had the information about the dominant Aeroclore at the start of our investigation, we may have been able to better target our resources and efforts to focus on this property first. So the last thing I want to say is that while these methods, they don't replace our current prioritization process, uh, they do provide us with additional tools um, that we can use to better prioritize our catchments and identify sources. And the stormwater programs are eager to use the data set that's been produced through this project. Um, and we're looking forward to applying these methods to our larger data set and also the data that we collect in the future um, to continue to support our ongoing source investigation work. And with that, I will turn it back over to Lester to provide a summary. Thanks, Lisa. So in summary, the RMP has developed two new methods for stormwater monitoring data analysis to gain insights about pollution sources and locations where management actions have the greatest water quality benefit. The old methods of ranking based on concentrations only allowed us to make comparisons at the whole watershed scale, which was a, a key weakness. By estimating yields, we are now able to directly compare PCB loads coming from older industrial areas, one to another, uh, the actual scale at which management is occurring. By fingerprinting the error clause, we can get further hints about the possible sources in these older industrial areas to assist in source property identification. And as Lisa has uh, aptly described, the methods are starting to be put into really use, a really good practical use. And thus, I think we might agree or contend that there was, it was RMP budget well spent. Thank you. Great. Really nice presentation, you guys. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, maybe we'll have time for one question and then we'll move into our our panel uh, moderated Q&A session. Um, and I think that this is probably either for Lester, you or Lisa, um, is we've talked about, we have thresholds for concentrations in water um, and uh, in suspended sediment or sediment, um, bedded sediment. Um, 
do we anticipate having some kind of threshold for yields? Um, I can start. Um, I would anticipate having a threshold for yields. I think it'll be very interesting to look a little bit more at all the data. Um, I want to emphasize that we're using these to prioritize where we go first. So we kind of start at the top and then we work our way down the list. So even with those thresholds, it's not cutting us off um, and saying we're not going to ever at some point in the future. Um, it's just about prioritizing where we go first. So yeah, I think we will look at the, the highest yields first and then work our way down. Okay. Um, uh, let, let's go ahead and move, move into the, the moderated uh, Q&A session. Um, there are a few other questions for, for you, um, Lisa and, and Lester, but I think we can handle them during the, the broader Q&A session. So anyone has questions that, um, for um, any of the presenters of this session, please go ahead and type them into the Q&A at the bottom of your screen, uh, and we'll try to get to them uh, um, as, uh, as soon as possible. Um, so uh, kind of building on the PCB and Mercury um, talk, uh, the question came up about, you know, is it possible to use this methodology, not just for old industrial areas, but for specific types of sources like electric transformers, electricity transformers or rail lines um, and, and not just kind of broader old industrial types of types of use as well. Uh, I'll take that one, Chris. Um, no is the short answer because of the, um, the challenge we have with the overall data set, which is a bottom of the watershed data set. So we can only lump the main contributing PCB source areas together as a single lump we can't separate out um, the different types of old industrial. So the answer is uh, a, a definitive no. Can I just add though, one, one note to that is you tended to have more things like transformers um, and rail lines going into old industrial areas. So you may still have a concentration of those type of sources in the old industrial areas to begin with. So even though you're not specifically targeting one of them, um, they do tend to, to be higher uh, in those areas anyway. Thank you, Lisa. Um, moving back over to microplastics. So the question came up is, do plastic you know, food wrappers emit dangerous chemicals as they start to break down? So not just the particles themselves, but the chemicals that food wrappers, you know, um, uh, disposable food, single use food wrappers might have. What, what do we know about that, Kelly or, or Diana? Diana, do you want to start or do you want me to start? Uh, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think we don't know very much at this point. So that, there aren't even really good solid data linking wrappers and other debris to the microplastics that are in the environment. We know there's a linkage, it's pretty obvious, but there's not data there. And so many people are focused just on the plastic. This is a great example of the bifurcation between the plastic bits and the chemicals. So there hasn't, to my knowledge, there's been um, inventories of chemicals in plastic but there hasn't, to my knowledge, been a look at are those chemicals and how are those chemicals released, either in the laboratory setting or in ecosystems. So, so this is something that I, we see as a really big scientific research data need. And we're looking for encouraging folks to do that work to support our work that applied science at the RMP. Yeah, having been involved in this for the last 20 years on the trash uh, nexus with water quality, I think there's so much we don't know still, right, Kelly? I mean, it, it, there is so much work to do. Um, Diana, did you want to add any anything on that? No, that was good. Okay. Um, so maybe a switch to, you know, um, air deposition and dispersion of tire particles and microplastics. I think that was a 
one of the key kind of unknowns uh, or missing data points that we have in the conceptual models. And um, you know, what do we know about tire wear dispersion? Does it does it land within the the right of way itself? Um, there's also a question I think from Mike Connor about you know does is it different on interstates than it is on local roads? You know, kind of in the brake pad discussions we've had in the past, and then. Lastly, Don uh, Yi asked about kind of is there are there data that are out there that maybe have air samples that have been collected by other types of agencies that we might be able to adapt um, for tire wear? Oh, all really great questions. Let me see if I can get to something here without talking for the rest of the time because this is a very interesting topic. So, uh, in in terms of just to deal with the formulation kind of question, uh, tires are all different from each other. I, there was a really interesting study out of Australia where they were able to show the diversity in formulations just in rubber content. Uh, so, and and I forgot to say something that I think is really important, which is that uh, tire manufacturers and other manufacturers of plastic products they aren't deliberately adding pollutants to get them dispersed in the environment. This is not their intent, and we know that. So we're actually hoping that one of the positive outcomes of our work is to inform the understanding of how those chemicals get out there so that manufacturers can continue on the journey that most of them are on already towards designing safer products. So I just really want to press on that. Um, there are different market segments in the tire market. Uh, so we do know that truck tires are probably different than car tires, but exactly how that breaks out and where those differences and commonalities might lie is um, also something we don't know. And I'm really hoping that the Beacon group study from UC Berkeley is gonna help us understand those market segments so that we can start thinking that through a little bit better. Uh, but nobody's done a like study of chemical formulation of the different tires. Um, so back to the kind of main question, which is about air transport. Uh, what, what we know is on a mass basis that tire wear debris um, falls out within maybe 30 feet or so of the road, most of the mass. But the uh, particles, some of them are very, very small. And chemical release is a function of surface area of the chemicals or of the particles. So the, even though most of the mass falls close to the road, most of the surface area we don't know where that goes because it may be that most of the surface area is actually on the fine particles that are dispersed over long distances, in which case they would land all over town. So in that case, we would not solve our problems by only addressing the roads in immediate roadside area. We know for sure that most of it doesn't fall directly on the roads. And this was a myth in brake pads as well. Where everybody thought that they put on their brakes and everything fell right on the roads. Therefore, we could clean up road runoff and everything would be better. And the same story seems to be there for, for tires. They, uh, we know for sure that it doesn't fall right on the road and therefore getting the runoff right off the road isn't going to solve this problem. What we don't know is whether things that fall far away are equally or perhaps even more important than stuff that, that lands near the road. So that's why um, the, the, the theory that we could just treat runoff with green infrastructure from roads and solve this problem is unlikely to, to really do it. Yeah, I think that on top of there's a lot of roads um, and there's a lot of area <laughs> that would be a, a whole, whole, whole lot of uh, green infrastructure we're talking about as well. Um, Lisa, um, or Diana, did you want to add anything on the air depth side of things? I'm sorry. I had one more thought was um, from that Brainy et al. paper that I mentioned um, that high speed travel probably helps disperse the particles higher into the atmosphere and contributes more to long range transport. So that's really important for fibers. So like, for example, dryer vents, you know, they'll, they actually propel the exhaust up into the atmosphere. And that, that's part of why fibers can travel so far. Yeah, and I was just thinking about like, um, th they're finding like traffic coming in and out of urban centers is a big, is a big contributor to um, air transport. Great, thank you for that. Um, Lisa um, and Lester, um, a question about, so we identify the source areas, are there, what happens next? You know, what it, what is the next step from a management standpoint? Are these uh, different types of, uh, of, of uh, approaches helping us 
not only identify, but then implement management actions on those properties themselves that are identified? What's the process by in the Bay Area that we follow on that? And there are examples of where remediation has happened. So um, the process is that we once we identify sites that look like they may have elevated PCBs, we do very thorough investigations. Um, and the Santa Clara program has been doing these investigations over the last 10 years or so. Um, we go in, we look at records, we look at, you know, uh, aerial photos of, you know, historic, trying to look at um, what might have been on some of these properties in the past that may have been associated with PCBs. And then we identify what we call suspect properties. We look at those properties more carefully. Sometimes we do site visits. Um, and then we actually go and collect samples either on or adjacent to these properties. Um, so that we can identify which ones are contributing the PCBs to uh, the public right-of-way areas. And then once we've identified those source properties, um, then there's a number of options which all include um, getting the property abated, either by working directly, you know, the cities may work directly with the property owners, or we have a process where we refer to um, the regional water board for them to follow up on abatement actions. Um, so that's that's specifically what happens after. So it's um, finding where to go is just really, you know, one step in a pretty long process. Um, and then we do have sites that are, um, that we've referred to the water board that are actively being addressed. Um, I, can't speak to any in Santa Clara that have been completely abated at this point. They're still in process, um, but that is a process that that continues and with the goal of, of abating the PCB sources from those properties. Great, thank you. Um, it's a lot of work, I know, and being involved in it <laughs> to try to get to that point and definitively be able to say that this property is providing large concentrations or loads of, of PCBs. Um, it, it takes a lot of investigation and, and justification to, to engage those properties in that manner. So, Kelly, did you want to mention something else? Okay, um, I just saw you took your mic off. So, um, uh, there is a question from uh, about maybe you and Diana can talk a little bit about kind of where the RMP is going on the overall strategy, um, kind of the stormwater um, uh, focus and and on on um, microplastics and on tires and what what do we, I know you mentioned it in your presentation, but what do we have planned over the next year, let's say, on on some of those 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 efforts. Kelly, do you want to talk about the tire strategy? Uh, or yeah, or stormwater monitoring and, and when we expect uh, for some of the emerging contaminants as well to uh, information to come out. Um, I know people are very interested in that and and because it is, it's not being looked at a lot of other places around the world, right? So, I mean, we are kind of in the forefront on many of these um, efforts. So um, what's the timing on, on this? I guess if we ever get rain rain again, um, that would that would help. Uh, to be able to finish our sampling, but um, maybe give a give a status of some of the existing pro uh, projects we have going on in the the stormwater uh, emerging contaminants and and the tire strategy as well. Maybe I could start with the um, CEC stormwater monitoring. We're currently in the fourth and last year of our monitoring uh, for stormwater, and we will be getting um, all of that data and uh, analyzing that um, after we get this last data set um, early next year at the end of, oh, we'll, we'll collect, finish collecting samples and then analyze data next year. And, and I can add on, that's the fourth year of a three-year study. So the big holdup here is that it hasn't rained. Uh, the, I, I, I think that we've, you know, probably everyone's guessing that the early results you know, are that we are finding emerging contaminants in stormwater, and that's really no surprise. Um, they have been detected in other places, Washington, uh, Toronto. There are a few other studies um, in North America. 
um, that have detected some of the same chemicals that we're monitoring for. So I don't think that we're going to discover we're unique, but we won't know until we actually assess and analyze the data. And that, that those preliminary results were enough for the RMP to determine that it, one of its important directions is to understand stormwater as a source of emerging contaminants in the Bay. So uh, we are launching uh, this fall a uh, two-year project where we'll be developing a strategy for uh, prioritizing and uh, developing monitoring uh, approaches and plans for emerging contaminants in stormwater. So it's not actually a monitoring plan, it's an approach that we'll use and we'll be focusing in the early uh, times on those questions of are these uh, emerging contaminants present and uh, what is the potential for that load to be big as, as, big as, as compared to say small um, as compared to other sources. So it's in the very early days of that work. Um, it's a pretty major pivot for our stormwater work because uh, we've been focused for a really long time on um, pollutants that are not primarily used today and uh, pollutants that are sediment associated. And now we're asking some really different questions. So we're gonna be bringing in our powerful modeling tools that we've been developing and a lot of new kinds of thinking and information like the conceptual models uh, the good example of that is the microplastic conceptual models that Diana's talking about. Those things can really inform our monitoring strategy and make it as cost effective as possible. That's great. Thank you, Kelly, for the update. I'll, I just want to mention one other thing and I'll hand it back over to Tom. Um, I, I think that the, the work that was presented here today is, is just symbolic of the collaboration at the RMP um, that we all go through both dischargers um, te technical uh, scientists, uh, engineers, SFEI staff, all of our, our counterparts within other organizations. So it, it really is a collaborative effort at the end of the day to try to try to, try to figure this stuff out uh, and, and try to figure out what's important, uh, maybe what's le least less important and, and how to move be best move forward in a, in a pragmatic way. So um, I don't I don't think that can be overstated enough. We are unique in that way and it has worked really well. Um, and we've been able to discover a lot of interesting things that probably we wouldn't have discovered if we weren't doing it together. Um, so I, I think that's going to continue in the future with the RMP. And, and with that, I'll, I'll hand it back over to Tom. Um, and, uh, and we're a couple minutes early, but maybe we can unless you had a question you wanted to ask, to ask the panel. Well, I got a comment to make, and you might be, might still be time for another question if you want to mine the options. I just wanted to make two points. One is building off of a response that Kelly made earlier, and I, and I appreciate she was being cautious, but the question about chemicals and plastic wrap. Well, we know by design, plastics have lots of chemicals in them for various purposes, plasticizers, stabilizers, and the like. So, it's like, what are they? It's like, we don't, you know, there, there's, there's some re research in this, but it's likely that all forms of plastic could be sources of contaminants of concern. And that, that'll be part of our ongoing strategy to figure that out. Uh, so, I, I, but that I wanna just add to what Kelly said, in addition to our completing our current uh, emerging contaminants and runoff studies and the uh, development of the, this, what will be a long-standing strategy that's starting. We have also uh, made emerging contaminant monitoring a key component of our review of the status and trends program to make sure the design of our status and trends more program is more amenable to looking at the status and potentially trends of emerging contaminants in the system, not only in, in water, sediment, and biota in the bay, but we're also going to integrate uh, some source monitoring for status and trends for early indicators. So a lot of the focus of the RMP is moving from uh, improving our understanding of what we've, the problems we created in the past to the problems that are now challenging us and may be future challenges. So uh, it's going to be essentially becoming more and more of the San Francisco Bay Emerging Contaminant Regional Monitoring Program, if you will, as we hopefully close the door on some of these past problems, at least relative to uh, data needs to inform uh, decisions, although we still have challenges ahead, obviously, as noted in our PCB work. So, um, yeah, 
And, and as I said, Tom, that the, you know, on the stormwater side, it's forever evolving. Um, it, it, you know, anything that gets produced or used or exposed, you know, is, is likely to, you know, be seen in stormwater. So it's, it's, our work is not done <laughs> by any means. We have to, con we will be continuing on a different path that um, uh, poses and then that will probably change in the future and we'll have to evolve again as that happens. Right, and I'll have one more thing is kind of emphasized by the speakers as a whole, but, but like what we're doing by under, about like understanding PCB sources and the ability to intervene loading to the bay, what we're doing with emerging contaminants, microplastics is, is so far beyond anything out that's going on in, in certainly, certainly California and the country. We're so fortunate to have this platform where we can uh, focus our resources uh, towards answering these questions that aren't being answered much at all anywhere else. So we're we're way ahead of the curve, and but we help affect others people's interest. Uh, ideally, we can get other people's uh, financial resources to help us augment this great work that we do in in the region. So thank I really appreciate uh, all that this this panel is particularly is working on in the RMP. Well, we're at 2, 226, so we are at break time. Uh, Melissa, am I, do you have, do you speak up now just to do the transition or we just tell people that they're, they're free to break until the next session, which starts at 240? You've got it. All right, see you all in 15. <laughs>